Welcome to Recovery Matters. We are a program of Lowell House, and as you all know out there, I don't have to say this to people, we are a 48-year-old agency. We've been in Lowell since 1971, and uh, it's just a terrific agency. I've been the CEO of Lowell House for the past five years. My name is Bill Garr, and this is actually our eighth, or maybe our ninth, I've kind of lost count, episode of Recovery Matters, and we've covered some great topics. I mean, real punchy topics that I think have captured people's imagination. I get so many good comments on them. Uh, everyone knows someone, a little bit about how everyone has someone they know that has an addiction issue. Uh, we've done, uh, uh, how do I know I'm addicted? Uh, so many people come to us and say, I think I might have a drinking problem. I think I, I might be a functional alcoholic. That's what we get a lot. Mm -hmm. Am I addicted really? So we have a wonderful show on that. And we're not gonna give you answers to any of these questions, but if you wanna find out a little bit more about these, our episodes, and if you haven't gotten enough of me, because you'll get more of me on these, uh, you can go on www.lowellhouseinc.org and they're all there. You can watch them at your leisure. You can gather your friends. You can have a Lowell House Recovery Matters TV night if you want to. So, new on this program, we have this wonderful set, because we're not seeing it, because we're in front of a green screen, but Matt and the crew here have been wonderful in helping us come up with a set that we think looks very good. So we'd love to have your comments on it. Uh, it's kind of like you know, Channel 7 News. So uh, welcome again. Uh, we have a very important program today or tonight, depending on when you're watching. And it's called Recovery Begins, but when in the world does it end? So it's about as you age and as you're in recovery and you've really sort of turned your life around, does recovery just go away and does your life become just like everyone else's where you don't worry about drugs or alcohol or anything else or is it something that stays with you a lifetime and something you constantly have to pay attention to so I think we'll start by uh, and I want to introduce my guest we have Mike Young over here uh, and I'm gonna call him Matt because everybody in the studio by the way is named Matt so uh, <laughs> it is Mike Young and Mike Young is a new friend but he's a former school administrator and uh, retired, you can tell he's the only one wearing a t-shirt in the group. Uh, and this is Sharon Roberts. Uh, Sharon's been my friend for the past five years. She is also our program manager over at uh, the Sheehan program, our excellent, excellent program for women, one of the best in the state, so we're so proud of that. And right next to me is my newer friend, Rich Hollett. He's a recovery coach for Lowell House, and I think uh, he will be hopefully one of many recovery coaches in the future. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll start this by really asking you the question I think a lot of people ask you, and that is, how, what does recovery mean to each of you, and how did it start? I mean, what made your decision to go into recovery? Uh, and several of you, I think all of you, have been in recovery for quite a while. So we want to talk a little bit more about that, about how to make it last, but we have lots of folks out there that are saying, you know, think about taking that next drink. Mm -hmm. How did these folks do it? So we'll start on this end with... Uh, um, well, uh, when I drank, things happened and, and if you were with me things were going to happen to you too and i had no control i had no control over who was coming uh and and that's not trying to be light about it i i just really never it was showtime yeah. a, and everybody was going to get involved a, and and it now left do you, do you remember any of those things actually quite a few and they're hurtful. Sure if you don't I, mean, they're, through, yeah. I mean a lot of them are hurtful because uh, th there was always somebody else involved oh, yeah. a and, and uh, so you know my family took the blunt of this uh, you know I, I had disgust in my father's eyes he didn't even know he had a son uh, my mother pity there was no way I want you know just my own arrogance I didn't want anybody's pity uh, you know my sisters and, and brothers were all afraid of me uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, who went through it with me, uh, I, I have another daughter and a son, but they've never seen me drink. But she went through the whole thing, and, and they did an intervention on me, and, and she said, I, I didn't know. Uh, I, I never knew all my friends' fathers are like him. And, and you know, I almost cried because uh, I thought she was going to be doomed. Uh, this is what she knows. This is where she'll end up. And I knew my life wasn't what I wanted for her. So, so basically what got me into it was uh, every fiber of my being 
didn't want to be the person I was. I had no idea how to get out of it. No idea. You look at any picture of, of my family, they all, Christmas, they all have drinks in their hands. They, without exaggerating, Newman Square in Cambridge is where I grew up. There were 11 bars in a one block area. They couldn't buy you from a bar because you'd just go across the right. street. Right. You know? That's right. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of my life that, uh, that I'd like to get rid of, but it's there. And, 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 uh, and I've learned to cope with it through going to AA. Okay, and we, uh, we want to talk more about that. Yeah. Uh, but let's, let's go over to Sharon. At least we'll get the beginning. Yeah. We'll get the beginning, then we're going to go on to uh, other things. But I, I think the, the, the main thing you mentioned, though, Mike, is so difficult. People always assume that with at Lowell House we see mainly opioid addicts and people mm -hmm. that are injecting heroin. We see about 52 to 55 percent of the people we see are, are alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And it's still the predominant disease and addiction because it is so easy. If you ever go on a cruise, you know everybody all day is walking around with a drink in their hand mm -hmm. with an yeah. open bar. And, uh, yeah. and they have friends of Bill on the ship, but I wonder how people do that because mm -hmm. that's a tremendously mm -hmm. difficult situation. So Sharon, how about you? Uh, well, I have a typical story. Um, I had started drinking when I was about 12 years old. Interventions throughout my adolescence from my family. But finally, when I was 23 years old, I was working at General Electric in Lynn. And um, I just was very tired. Sick and tired of being sick and tired, as they say in AA. And um, I went to the EAP program and reached out to a fellow there, I'll say his name, Cecil Kelly, and said, I really need some help. I um, finally told the truth about my drinking, um, and I was out of control. I thought I was fooling people, but they all knew that absenteeism was directly linked to um, drinking too much. And that was April 27, 1982, and I have not had a drink or a, a relapse since then. Wow, Come on, congratulations. Mm -hmm. You know, I always loved life, and at the end of my drinking, I did not love life. Um, my freedom was taken away, so uh, sobriety translates into freedom for me. Well, here's an interesting thing. The government estimates that because of drinking and drugs, we lose about six billion dollars a year in productivity, mm -hmm. and this is absenteeism. And you see it in some of our employees as we go through it. They, you begin to get a week or two mm -hmm. on Mondays. Uh, you know, after a long weekend of drinking, they just don't show up for a few days. So mm -hmm. that's a that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And by the way, for our folks out there, what Lowell House also does is we help companies try to deal with that with their mm -hmm. employees and what kinds of things can they do and how they can help their employees move like you did mm -hmm. into a better place because what we hear and you know you hear a lot of it and what, what you do mm -hmm. is people feel broken mm -hmm. they feel like they're just not getting anything out of life and like you said Mike they're hurting their family their kids don't know anything else they, everybody's an alcoholic mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's tough for families rich what about you I was a um, binge drinker for the most part my whole life. I always had a sensitivity to alcohol and an awareness that I had to be really careful of it. I even from a young age, I just knew the feeling I got from drinking was way too good compared to how I felt without it. So I went through my life literally trying not to drink. So, you know, you had one, you had no relapses. I had too many to count mm -hmm. because it was a binge drinking. Mm -hmm. So what happened with me is I wouldn't drink for a while, you know, six, eight months. I think the longest then I went was like a year and a half. And my life would be going way up here. And the feedback from the world would be, wow, good job. Rich looks great. He's doing great. He's accomplishing. He's successful. But the feeling I had beneath that was so far from the feedback. I felt so badly about myself, some mm. fundamental shame of just being worthless and so my binge drinking became the only thing I knew how to do, really, to, to close the gap. The gap was th what was painful, is to bring myself down and sort of provide myself with the evidence, yes, you are, in fact, a loser. Mm. Um, so the, the, the miracle of my recovery really was just about me finally wanting to give myself a, a chance to, s to stay up there. Not, you know, a lot for me, but also my mother was terrified she was going to lose me, um, my family. 
had seen me go through that up and down, up and down for so many times. They just, it, and most of my drinking was in private, so I didn't go out in the world and cause a ton of chaos, although there are some exceptions to that. Um, but so really, at that point, w when it really changed for me was I, when I, I literally just ended my, my relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, I even ended it with treatment because between the drinking and the treatment, the drinking and the treatment, the drinking and the treatment, it, it was a smoke and mirrors for me to just start feeling good about myself and sharing myself with the world and staying there. Okay. Well, that's so interesting because now there are a, a couple hundred people out there that just said, well, look, maybe I don't need treatment after all. What, why didn't that work for you? It was, uh, I would say, in retrospect, it was 100% me <laughs> yeah. that, it didn't, that it didn't work. I, I, I really believe, and I'm super, like, I don't complain about treatment. I, treatment doesn't work. That's not me at all. I work in treatment. But for me personally, there was something that, and I don't know if other people need to do this or if this was just me, so I want to say this responsibly. There was something about my experience that required me to go inward. And I don't mean isolate at all. I know that's not a good thing. Go inward and connect to something inside of me. And then, of course, bring it out into the world and you know, cultivate it. And so it was I both inward and relational. I, I had to, there was something I had to cultivate within mm -hmm. me that just to connect to myself so then I could bring that into the world and, mm -hmm. and stay connected. It was, a, it was a connection thing. You and I have talked about yeah, that yeah, absolutely. quite a bit. Um, so it was my pe people in treatment, people out there in the world could be cheering me on, telling me they love me, giving me support, seeing all sorts of good things in me. But as long as I didn't see those things, I was... It, it, it was a little bit of, there was a big haze between me and them, so I don't really know what the clinical words to put onto that are or how to really describe it beyond my own personal experience, but it was very, um, it was highly personal and intimate and it, it was my own, it, the, the pathology of addiction didn't really come into play for me. I, and I, and I, I play games with trying to figure that out too, but really, it, it was so personal that the only way treatment would have worked is if someone came along and recognized that and told me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And, and you know, it, it, it's so personal for people. Mm -hmm. uh, we have lots of people. It's like, you know, we have uh, I've been in Weight Watchers for years trying to keep the weight down. And I have many friends who will say, I can't go to those meetings. When I go to those meetings, I feel like eating. And uh, <laughs> people will say that about AA sometimes. When I go to the AA meetings, I come on, I feel like I need a drink. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's so individualized. So, you know, I remember in our old Appleton Street facility, you go back in those days, uh, there was a sign up there, a big sign, don't give up, the miracle could be just around the corner, it could be tomorrow. The miracle happened for each of you and for a lot of people that have so much trouble, it, an intervention, a feeling tired at work, a sort of something in your life, what was it, uh, what did you feel that finally said, okay, I am gonna resist that next drink and I'm not gonna do any more? I, I don't ever, uh, ever feel that I did anything. You know, um, and, and, I, and I'm not religious. I mean, if you knew my history, you'd I'm not religious, but, but it, it becomes a spiritual thing with me that I just started feeling good about myself. And then those things that you were talking about, those highs, those things just happened. That's right. I didn't, I, I, I did nothing special. I got in the car when a group of people uh, decided to, to give what they had freely to me. Uh, and I just got in the car. I was so sick and tired of sick, I just, I was beat up. And I just, I had to find a way. Uh, same thing, Blue Cross must think I'm dead because uh, uh, many, many, many detoxes and halfway houses. The, I, I went from the wet shelter to go in to teach in a classroom. Uh, so the, the miracle came just through people and it was allowing it to happen. That was, I guess, for the first time in my life, I allowed myself to receive the help that, that was given to me. Uh, you know, I, I, I laugh, the, uh, that awakening that you have, that your life has gotten better. Uh, I was sitting in a pizza place and I was with those gentlemen that were helping me, and I went, I got it. 
and they're looking at me strangely, and they thought I'd lost it this time. And then they, uh, I says, you know, phew, glad that's over with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and it, I felt that. I felt it inside. And that is so exceptional, Mike. We have so few people that really achieve that and say, okay, today it's done. I'm not going back. Have you ever had a temptation to go back? Have you ever had a drink oh, in your hand and said, absolutely. oh, that would be that's great? I envy people. I've been sober 31 years. I envy people that can do it. You know, I liked it. I had fun. You know, but it didn't have fun for me. You know, I lost almost everything in my life. You know, one daughter was the only one that stayed with me, and, uh, and that was it. You know, that's all changed. That's yeah. all changed, but. And we hear so many times, it's, it's religion, people find no. Jesus. It's something no. else, it's, you know, it's something. It's love, it's babies, it's children, it's family. What about in your life? What really, I know you said you reached a point where you just felt so broken and tired. But off, a lot of times, that's the time when people continue drinking and they say, okay, well, I'll feel, I get a drink, I'll feel better. I think it was the truth. I mean, you have that moment of clarity and truth, and, and I think what you said, Rich, is I knew the problem was me. It was here. It was emotional, physical, spiritual, and I have brothers and sisters that weren't doing what I was doing, so I knew something was different. And psychotherapy throughout my adolescence, you know, because I always wanted to identify the problem. Um, but finally, I was willing to be honest and say it was the alcohol. It was not people, places, and things. It was me. Um, and I just, I was willing to do and have blind faith that the people in AA, I could see a difference in their eyes. I could see the light in their eyes. I can, could see the freedom that they had. And I just was willing to um, follow instructions for the first time in my life have a sponsor that would say, go to a meeting, kid, don't go to the bars, watch the football game at home, um, make better choices, you know. I cut loose any old friends that I had, made a lot of changes, and um, my family, uh, my sisters, I, I think that they were my saving grace, my brothers, um, and knowing that it could be different that I wasn't intending, it wasn't intended for me to be spending my time in bar rooms after work. Um, and I had been settling for less. I mean, it's a journey. But yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I want to talk yeah. in a minute about that journey, too. But you've now been at Lowell House, what, 20? 15 years. 15 yes. years. Yes. Okay, so you're, you're kind of a newbie. <laughs> I guess I'm really you're just, a, you're just a rookie. Uh, and we've actually had some people that have been with us 25, 30 years, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. wonderful. So you've helped thousands of people <clears throat> over your course of your career uh, deal with their recovery, go into recovery, and have a better life, which is something to be very proud of. Uh, but in the end, for you, uh, it really was saying it's me. It's me. It's not them. It's mm. me. Mm. And that seems to be the one thing that's all common with almost all people that go into recovery, mm -hmm. is it's not my mother's fault, it's not my father's mm -hmm. fault, it's not the bar, you know, the mm -hmm. bar's fault. They, they're serving me, so I'm going to drink unless mm -hmm. they stop serving me. What about you, Rich? When did you say, it's me, I'm the, f I'm the fault, not the people out there? Um, mm. I don't know if, it w if there was a moment that I think it happened, you know, slowly, but I, I definitely feel like that is exactly what happened ultimately is that I realized it was all me and you know when you said the word allow that's what th that played a big part in my recovery was just allowing first of all allowing the people that loved me to love me because mm -hmm. I was really good at you know going put my hand up to that um, but you know, if, if there was a moment, and this happened a couple years before, truthfully, this happened a couple years before I actually ended my relationship with alcohol, but my mother once said to me, Rich, if you were as good to yourself, as kind to yourself as you are to everybody else, because again, I was a binge drinker, so I, I, was, I was in there busy helping mm -hmm. my family do and do and do and work and, you know, being a good brother, a good uncle, good friend, and then <laughs> mm. So that that seed that my mother planted definitely grew and, and I would say if, if there was one thing I could attribute my recovery to, that was it. That was, that, that was a 
a pivotal moment for me, and even that, though it took a little while to and catch And that up. moment stands out in your life as something you remember. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And oftentimes it's exactly that. It's a loved one. And mm -hmm. uh, so it's so important that loved ones get involved in the process mm -hmm. and they don't give up. Boy, it's hard not to give up on someone, isn't it? Especially when you relapse. Uh, have any of you had relapses? Oh, yeah. Yeah? I had, I, uh, not a badge that I carry, but uh, I had 51 detoxes. Uh, wow. So uh, it became a game with me, mm -hmm. given that my job afforded me these breaks every six weeks. That's how I spent two years of my life, uh, Christmas. Uh, February, mm -hmm. April, the summer, uh, and then started all over again. Thanksgiving, I spent many a holiday in there just to keep it, m to defend my right to drink. Uh -huh. uh, and and the word that both of you have brought out, that there's a sense of honesty. I, me, I was incapable at that point in my life of, of ever dealing with. I just couldn't. Blaming other people, I don't think I blamed anybody, but, but there was a million reasons why I continued to drink. It was inevitable that when I left the detox, it was only a matter of time. Right. And, and I lived that life. And, and, uh, and again, that was that spiritual part of it. I, I got beat up so bad from the alcohol and the drugs uh, <coughs> that I just, uh, I couldn't do it anymore. I yeah. couldn't do it. I had to turn somewhere. Well, and that's why it's so important that we keep people alive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. if people die, there's no chance of it. I Absolutely. mean, maybe on that 50th uh, relapse, if you, had, if you had succumbed, you wouldn't be here today and done all the great things you've done, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think that's a, a lesson to us all. In fact, I think in many ways, recovery really teaches us a lot about mm -hmm. the human spirit and we were fortunate to have Marty Walsh, Mayor Walsh, speak at our breakfast. Sharon, you were there. Mm -hmm. Rich, were you there? Yeah, yes. Rich was yeah. there. And come next year, okay. now that you're a friend. <laughs> uh, and I, I think listening to the, the mayor, and he spoke so bluntly and mm -hmm. honestly about being in recovery and falling down face first in a puddle outside a mm -hmm. bar, being in meetings, and all he could think about is what bar my friend's not going to mm -hmm. be at so I can go and drink because they're going to get after me. Uh, and when he went into recovery, he could have run for the legislature two months afterwards. Best decision he ever made, he waited a year and a half. And he stayed in recovery all that time and mm -hmm. has been obviously in recovery since. So it was a, a blunt and honest piece. So when we look at your lives as you look back now, what's kept you? After your 51st, I'm still reeling over. <laughs> I told you, Blue Cross thinks I'm dead. Well, uh, <laughs> well, I'm sure they're glad you're in recovery because yeah, you want to almost put Blue Cross out of business, you know that. Uh, you, you know, I, I think that's, that's amazing and uh, that's really the most I've ever heard. Usually people have four or five, six Ooh, relapses, right. but that's quite a bit. So what kept, what's kept you in recovery all these years? All my life, I, I was I had it together. There was no reason for me, or no apparent reason for me, to become who I became. I mean, I, I had money in my pocket. I had girls on my arm, and it sounds funny coming from a seventy-year-old. But I had <laughs> girls on my arm, and I had I dressed real well. Well, you were also on their arm too. Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I was a, a better than average athlete, uh, and, and so you know I had it all together, and, and yet. This wasn't going to happen for me. Now I forgot where we were going. Seventy years well, old. Let me let me let me, <laughs> ask, let me ask Sharon that too. What's kept you in recovery? I would say um, they often say in, in meetings you have a gift of desperation uh -huh. mm -hmm. and the ability to be honest and just stay steady on with what the problem was. I was so secretive about my drinking that I felt like once I told the truth about it, there was no going back. Um, I would say. Um, you know, I signed myself into a hospital, and I did it when my, most of my family was away on a vacation, and I wouldn't see them for about 10 days. And when I finally said yes, because I was deeply ashamed, I was deeply ashamed. I mean, if I was arrested for drunk driving, you know, the family lawyer would pull up and bail me out, and they'd pay the bill, the family would. Um, there wasn't a stigma a attached, oddly enough. But when I was in a hospital and then I went to a woman's halfway house, it was deeply stigmatized for me. 
I felt a great deal of shame, like how did a nice girl like me <laughs> end up at a place like this? Um, but you're still a nice girl <laughs> and you've been what, how many years sober? 36. And you've obviously worked at it. Do you, still get, do you still get the temptation occasionally? I'm careful. And I, I think working with women day in and day out and working in the recovery field, um, it could be me on yeah. the other mm -hmm. side of the door. A and Rich, what about you? You work in the field too. Don't I you do. Don't you feel like, geez, now that we talk about it, I feel like going and having a drink now. No, there's something so inspiring to me about um, even seeing people in their worst moments. I feel like I have a special knack to see their potential and to see beyond their suffering. I can certainly connect and relate to their suffering on every level. But I also, maybe because I've experienced my own and then I am where I am today, which is much different. So I really hold true to people's potential. To me, that's my biggest asset with, with someone. So that, that inspires me to, to stay in recovery. And you know, honestly, sometimes I feel guilty saying this, but I don't, I don't really have cravings. I, you know, I have moments of being down and, and moments of maybe remembering self-sabotage and feeling like that a little bit. But for the most part, I don't really, I've never specifically craved alcohol. Well, that's good. That's good. And, and some people don't. Some people do, some people don't. Well, listen, we are out of time. So thank you so much for sharing this with us <coughs> and telling us and your honesty because it's going to help a lot of people. And I do want to mention something. So don't touch that dial. Do they still say uh, that, Matt? Don't touch that dial. Don't touch that remote. That's what we want to say. <laughs> uh, we are having a great event on November the 8th at the Elks Hall. It is at 7 o'clock at night. We are welcoming back Dr. Ruth Potee. And uh, we've, uh, many of us have seen Dr. Potee. She is our guru for recovery and addiction. She's wonderful with parents. She's funny. She's smart. And she's still a full-time physician. And the best part about it, it's free. Isn't that the best charge of all? It's free, and we'd love to have you there. We have limited seats, so go on our site, www.lowellhouseinc.org, and you can see it there, and uh, come, join us. You'll learn a lot, uh, and you'll, I think, feel enlightened, and you'll feel good about yourself, and that's what it's all about, because recovery matters. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>